and we're live. Hi, everybody. Welcome back uh, to Coffee Class. And uh, it's John Warren, and um, it's our second week, so it's kind of exciting. Um, and and so many of you uh, signed on and, and bought me a coffee last week. Thank you all for contributing, contributing by being here um, and with your questions, which have been fantastic. So I hope everybody get a chance and saw the link to um, to Caught, the short film that I'm going to talk about a little bit. Um, and then I'm going to open it up to questions. So Caught is, a, I, I just think it's an amazing film. Um, Bruce Lee, not to be confused with Kung Fu Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee, spelled L-I, uh, was a uh, NYU Tisch film student uh, director a um, number of years ago. He made this film, he made Caught. Uh, it was a finalist, in fact, maybe it won our first run film festival. Uh, it's an amazing film. Um, Bruce is a wonderful filmmaker. And um, so a number of things I'll talk about. Well, I'll talk about a little bit about what happened with the film. The film was so solid that I, every June, this June probably won't happen, but every June I take our top three or four or five filmmakers from NYU to Los Angeles for a week. And um, we go all over town and we meet directors and producers and agents and managers and studio heads and a lot of people. We spend five days running from place to place. Um, we got out there the week, the, the year that Bruce uh, was a finalist. And by Wednesday of that week, Bruce had uh, signed with an agency and signed with a manager and his career would, had taken off. Uh, that's a long way of saying, um, if you make a film that's that's this solid, uh, they will come running for you. Um, and as, as I said, I think Bruce nailed it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the film. Um, first, I'll talk about the story aspects and then I'm gonna talk about the production value. The story aspects are really strong. I think the film's about 17 minutes long. Um, what Bruce crams into those 17 minutes is extraordinary. Um, right up front, first frame of the film, we meet the protagonist, we meet Gunn, and he's the guy we're going to follow. Um, so as you've probably heard me discuss, if, if you watched uh, Making the Short, um, you want to identify that protagonist, you want to identify his or her objective, you want to identify the antagonist. Um, if you have time, this is not always the case in a short film, you also would like to introduce um, the, the protagonist's inner need. And that's something that um, is often overlooked, not only in short films, but um, feature films. So what Bruce did with this film is, again, frame one. Hey, John, sorry to stop you real quick. Yeah. Um, can you see your Wi-Fi in the corner of your iPad? Yeah. All right. So you're connected to Wi-Fi and not like 5G or anything like that? Well, I don't know if it says Wi-Fi. It says uh, you're in the show. Everyone can see and hear you. Okay. Do you see your... I see a little picture of me in the upper right-hand corner. No, I mean like on your iPad itself, do you see the little Wi-Fi symbol in the top corner? What's it look like? Um... <laughs> Is it a little camera? <laughs> No, no. Um, it should be in the top right hand corner and it looks like the Wi Fi signal. Um, I don't see that. I see live on the other side of the screen. It says live 450. Yeah. Yeah. We're just trying to make sure that the, uh, that you're not connected through your data plan. Um, uh, if I am, well, what's, is that a problem? I mean, because it's just taking a little bit to, we're getting some internet connection problems, apparently. Okay, hang on one second. Oh, John, are you back? Yeah. So can you come back on? Apparently people are hitting, if they hit refresh, it's working for them. So I don't know if it's you. 
Okay, so now I'm back. All right, so now you're back, and I am back to letting you do your thing. Ramble. You're back to letting me ramble? Okay, <laughs> you're great. good. Thank you. Um, where was I? Uh, we, we've met Gunn, the protagonist. Oh, then again, what Bruce, in a short film, one of the real demands in a short film, you have so little time to, to do all of, all of the things you have to do in the first act. Um, we meet, we see, we, we establish the antagonist. And that, of course, is when the principal pulls up in his car and he blows the horn and tells the boys without saying so that he's watching them. So we know that's probably going to be the antagonist. He looks like the big bad guy. He's a monster. He's going to be our antagonist. Um, one of the things that Bruce does, which is, uh, you know, I like a lot, is he also introduces what what could be called, and I'm going to call it, um, Gunn's inner need. And that's done with just a couple shots when he sees uh, Felicia playing soccer. He sees her, the camera pants her point of view, from his point of view, seeing her. Um, they make eye contact. Um, so we know there's some connection there. Um, and then what happens, again, relatively early on, is we establish the, what's it called, wiggly top card. He wants the wiggly top card. Now, this is where uh, there's some really- Sorry, simple... wiggly puff. <laughs> what's it called, wiggly puff? Wiggly puff, oh, sorry. Wiggly puff. I, I had to jump, collected... I had to jump in. <laughs> I never collected, oh, now you're really gonna laugh at me. Uh, <laughs> uh, wait, don't tell me, don't tell me. They're called uh, Pokemon. Pokemon. Yeah. Yep, Pokemon. Because I used to call them Pokemon, and people corrected me about that, but it's Pokemon. I never collected them, let's just say that. <laughs> anyway, so it's Wigglypuff? Okay, Wigglypuff. Yeah, Wigglypuff. Wigglypuff, now that we've drilled down on Wigglypuff, that is the objective. Here's what's a little tricky in the story. You could debate that Gunn's objective is... Felicia. And what, what I strongly, what, 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 I, what I feel really strongly about, and it's so important to storytelling, it's um, you want to give your protagonist a tangible objective. Not that Felicia wouldn't be tangible, but you want to give him something that he's chasing. And as soon as he identifies Wiggly Puff, not to be confused with, you know, Wiggly Top. Um, he's in pursuit of that and it's impossible to get that card. Um, now keep in mind, we've established gun. We've established Felicia, his inner need. We've established, um, an antagonist and we've established an inner, uh, I said, inner need, an objective. All of those things have, have been taken care of within the first four or five minutes of the film. That is, um, that's astounding. And it's, and it's, it's, uh, it's a very demanding, again, short films are very demanding ways to tell a story. You have so little time. Bruce covers all that information within five minutes. So now, arguably, now the movie can start and he can start chasing that card. Um, the second act, I don't want to brush over it, but, but the second act is really about establishing obstacles so that gun cannot get card. And we must see to what lengths he will go to, to get that Wiggly Puff card. Um, the, the principal, by the way, is fantastic. He's a wonderful uh, uh, antagonist because he has all the power. If, if you don't make your antagonist really strong, you diminish the amount of conflict for the protagonist. And, and as I said last week, all drama is conflict. So the fact that he's the principal, he has all the authority, 
he can he can kill a gun. He can throw a gun out of school. Um, that makes him a wonderful antagonist. And then again, the second act is all about gun chasing that card. Um, the security uh, police are there. Um, they they're there for one reason: create obstacles, obstacle, 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 obstacle. That's all they do, make it impossible. And then I'm I'm I'm, sh I'm sure changing the second act a little bit, but we'll get into it once we get in the Q and A. And then the third act is is really wonderful. The third act is um, gun doesn't get the card. Gun has fought hard. He's fought a good fight. He's done the best he can, but he doesn't get the Wiggly Puff card. This is a real important design of story because your protagonist um, goes to great lengths to reach their objective. They go, he goes to great lengths to get the Wiggly Puff card. And this is the irony in, in, in narrative structure. You have your protagonist do all of that work. And then I hate to tell you, the objective in the third act turns out to not be that important. What's important is the protagonist has changed and corrected his or her flaw. Uh, in, in this film, Gunn doesn't get the Wiggly Puff card but he gets his inner need. He gets Felicia. Um, that's a fantastic design to do that, to take care of all that story business in 17 minutes is just extraordinary. Um, and, and I hope what you'll take away from that and, and some other shorts that we're gonna see is that every scene is in the film for a purpose. Every scene is designed and placed where it's placed to drive the story forward, to create more obstacles. Um, there are no scenes that are just arbitrary. Just here's a scene, two people sitting and talking. No, every scene must have purpose. And that's what you do when you're writing your script. You check the script and you say, okay, I've got this scene and uh, I like it. And it seems authentic, but does it really drive the story forward? Um, the scene that I see most from college students, I don't know why, but the scene that I see most often from college students is two guys, two guys sitting in a coffee shop talking about a girl or two girls sitting in a coffee shop talking about a guy. And the students say to me, oh, Mr. Warren, you know, it's really authentic. This is the way people speak. This is a, and I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that. In fact, the dialogue sounds authentic, but where's the conflict? And if you can't, if, if there's no conflict in the scene, it's not driving forward. It's not making us watch the film. Um, so I, again, I, that that's um, caught wonderful film. I'm, I'm eager to hear your questions. And in fact, later on, I'm going to talk about um, some of the production aspects that, that Bruce did such a great job with because uh, um, w one of the reasons that we emphasize writing the short, if you do it and you, and you, uh, you write a script uh, that's, that's not terribly expensive, you have the opportunity to go out and make a short film. Um, and you just have to have an eye on the budget. Uh, Bruce um, had some lucky breaks with this film in terms of production costs. And again, I'll go to that later. So, uh, Lexi, can we open this up and, and see take some questions? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Are these questions going to come to me verbally? What? Alexi? Ah, there we go. 
All right, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, cool. I switched away from Carl's terrible computer, hoping that that would help us with the connection. Um, let's see, waiting on some questions to come in. We had tons of questions last week. We do, I just, there's a slight delay. Oh, okay, I'm here. Where we're okay. live. All right, here we go. First part. question. Yeah. I'm going to read them to you so that um, people can... Everybody, everybody can hear them? Yep. So, hi, Professor. I understand structure. My problem has been identifying which stories I would like to tell. How do you find stories for you to create? And or what is your favorite brainstorm technique? Oh, Jonathan. Good question. So here's what you do. Or here's what I suggest. Um, it sounds like you... You. It sounds like you... you you're creative and you've got a rich imagination. And so there are a lot of stories that come through. You, you really will um, behoove yourself if you keep a list of stories. And what's going to happen over time, there's going to be one or two, maybe three stories that you just can't get away from. That just, and, and, and typically it's for reasons that you can't really identify but you say, God, this is a story that I'm dying to tell. And that story will keep moving to the forefront. You know, uh, you'll, you'll have a new story idea on Wednesday, but that one, that one, it's in the back of your head and it's been there for a month or it's been there for a year or it's been there for a few weeks. That's the one that keeps coming up. The one that, um, the, the one that keeps returning to you is the one that you're going to be passionate about and the one that you're going to want to stay with and work at. So, so keep, keep a list because it'll rotate, it'll change, but there are going to be one or two stories you can't get away from. And, and the one that you love and feel passionate about is the one that you'll work at the hardest. That's the way to do it. Okay. Right. So real quick. So now that we have more questions coming in, maybe we should start with some questions about caught. Um, so that's where I pulled this question. What is guns flaw? Is it that he lost Felicia's card in the first place? Yeah, that's a great question, Claudia. Um, I don't know. I don't know if Gunn, well, Gunn has a flaw, is that he, he has a flaw. Um, he's somewhat corrupt. I mean, don't you love the front of this movie when at first I think you think these guys are all dealing with drugs and they're, they're dealing with these stupid cards. Um, so, so he, he does fly below the radar. Um, he's doing, he's doing something at school that's, that's, uh, illegal at school. Um, does he correct his flaw? I don't think so. I don't think he really collects, corrects it. But again, in his short film and Claudia, what I want you to be mindful of, it's, that's a great question. You won't, in a short film, you won't always have time to take care of every element of story. Um, uh, I, I, we, we saw, um, based on a true story last night, and the, the girl, she doesn't really have a flaw. So sometimes it's good to be mindful, it's good for you as the writer, the filmmaker, to be mindful of that. And if you can find a way to put it, to, 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 to use it in the story, that's great. Um, I, I don't, Gun. if he has a flaw, it's that he's, He's somewhat corrupt, um, and he does not correct the flaw, in my opinion. Thank you. All right. Let's see. Here, this question's related. Can you please elaborate on the difference between a character's flaw and their inner need? Oh, good. Good question. Good question. Okay, that's that's a tough one. Uh, God, you guys made me work for my coffee. Um, the inner need is generally something that the protagonist is unaware of, particularly in the first act. So, um, and, and they, and f most often they're not aware of that inner need until the third act. It is correct. It is connected to the flaw. Um, uh, because the flaw, I hope I'm going slow. I, I hope I'm making this, I hope I'm being articulate about this. The flaw is established in the first act. 
it's corrected in the third act when we have resolution and it's usually identifiable with the underneath i'm gonna i'm gonna use i'm gonna continue you know if you haven't seen up go see up because i'm gonna continue to use it off and on throughout the next few weeks um carl uh is is a curmudgeon he doesn't like people he doesn't associate with people he's a misanthrope uh, he doesn't like people um and his inner need is that he that he is unaware of his intimacy so in the third act when he's sitting there with russell on this in the last scene of the film uh eating ice cream and, and counting cars he has intimacy he has something that he didn't know was his inner need but it is corrected to his flaw because his flaw was he he refused friendship and intimacy his inner need was the need for her but instead gun remains an outlaw as he throws the cards off the roof he does not give them to the principal in fact he does worse he makes sure that the principal can, can never get them can't collect them um he's a, he's a perfect anti-hero um and it's by the way it's really satisfying um to, for, for me anyway as an audience member i think it's a really satisfying choice to go with the anti-hero again the the hero um sees the the error of his ways or her ways um and they they correct their flaw uh the anti-hero sees the error of his or her ways and says nah i'm not going to correct my flaw i'm going to keep being an outlaw cool Hope that right. let's see um, and just for everybody, for everybody asking real quick about the connection, because we're having some issues. Um, what I've been, what I've been seeing from, you know, the streaming thing that we use is that basically YouTube has so many people going live that they're a little bit overloaded. So fortunately, the the stream, your stream, John, coming into yeah. me is perfect is perfectly clear. So when we post the video, but am I am I perfectly clear? Always, always, John. <laughs> but um, but when we post the recording of this uh, online, it'll be completely clear. So we'll be sure to post that after everything. So if you're if you're missing, if you're tuning in and out, um, yeah, I think it's just because YouTube's overloaded. Okay. Um, By the way, these are these are really good questions. I, lo I love these questions. They're really smart. Yeah, they. There are some pretty great questions i'm trying to figure it out um let's see um so here's a question about pitching no oh. so when pitching how much do you keep until the exec reads the full script is it possible to overshare and give too much away while pitching and sort of similar to that, it's like, do you reveal the the twist in the pitch? Oh yeah, okay, yeah, okay. So a couple of things. Uh, when pitching, how much do you keep until the exact read the script? So when you pitch, traditionally you don't have a script. So so a pitch meeting is um, the design of a pitch meeting is is uh, an executive, let's say at Warner Brothers has read your script and they love it and uh they want to meet with you so you go in and say here's a story idea that i have you know i'm a good writer you have you don't say that but your agent says it and you know i'm a good writer and and, and you because you read my script here's an idea i have for a movie you don't you have not written the script so i'm going to be clear about that when you're pitching there is no script written um and the purpose of the pitch is for the executive or the producer to say i get it I love it and I want to buy it. By that, by buy it, what they mean is I'm hiring you to write what you just pitched to me. Um, so, and then to your second, uh, uh, in terms of oversharing or, or, or revealing the, the reversal or the whole story, you want to tell the whole story because you got, you know, you got to suck them in. Um, so you don't want to withhold anything because you got to kill it in the room. And typically you've got about 15 minutes. So you walk in, 
I'm going to do a whole, uh, I'm going to do a whole class on this. Forgive my, forgive my immodesty, but I was, I was a good, I was good in the room. I was a good pitcher and I sold a lot of pitches and, um, uh, you go in the room and there's a little chit chat. And then the, and then the producer or studio executive will say, so you got an idea. Uh, we can't wait to hear it. And then you're on and you've got 15 minutes at most 15 minutes. And in that 15 minutes, you tell the whole movie, you don't leave anything out because when you're done, you want them to say, Oh my God, we're willing to write a check for you to write that that script. Um, so I think uh, I think that answers that. I hope that answers that. So here's another question to oh, loop back to Caught. Um, basically, the decision to choose kids rather than adults and to set this whole thing in a school. Um, just can you speak to that? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know. Uh, I, I never asked Bruce why he decided to do it this way. Well, I, but I have an instinct. So in case you didn't notice, uh, and I'm sure you did, what Bruce, um, what Bruce was marrying was the Bourne film, Jason Bourne films. Now, going back to the young man's question a few minutes ago, in terms of production, production value, production cost and location. So, you can't make this movie for a budget in New York City. Um, so what he did was he, he twi turned the whole thing on its head and made it about not about heroin, not about trading arms. He made it about Pokemon cards. Am I pronouncing it? Pokemon? I think. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, Mon. No man's. Pokemon. No man's. No man's. Pokemon. <laughs> Wiggly Top. No, not Wiggly Top. Wiggly Flop. Anyway. So what he did was to, 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 to hone it down and make it financially possible to shoot, he said, I can't shoot in New York City. Um, and he took the whole story and morphed it into, again, this middle school, I guess, or grade school, um, uh, because that was more feasible uh, for production reasons. I also, well, there's something else I was going to say about that. Oh, one of the things that happened... Um, if you get a chance to go back and look at the film again, one of the things that happened when we when we went to L.A. and, and we were screening it for agents and managers, um, and this happened, I was surprised this happened frequently. Uh, this gives you, this is a real practical aspect of filmmaking and making it short. A number of people said to Bruce, how many shots? How many shots are in that film? Now, so why is that? Why are they asking that? And here's why. They know that he had no money to make the film. They know he's a young filmmaker. Here's something that made me laugh, John. What's that? <laughs> it's here. Did the story start about heroin dealing in New York City? And yeah. then he moved it down to, you see the comment? <laughs> uh, so this started about heroin. No, no, it didn't start. Nicole, no, no. I was being facetious. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, you know, it's just dawned on me. If people don't get my sense of humor, we could end up in so, so much trouble here. But anyway, anyway. So, but, but what was fascinating about it was they were looking at Bruce and going, if you can knock down 40 shots a day, which is really rigorous, if you can do, if you can knock down 40 to maybe 50 shots a day, um, then if we gave you real money to make a real film, you know how to move, you know how to create shots, you know how to, how to move the camera, um, you know how to edit a film. Because that film, if you go back and look at Caught again, it is tightly edited. Because um, it, it, the pace is so fast. Again, it's based on uh, Jason Bourne, Jason Bourne films. Um, one last thing about this, uh, there's, I've seen this film so many times. One, one day, Bruce was in my class and we were watching the film he was a guest in the class. And I said, Bruce, I got to put you on the spot. And Bruce, well, I've known him a long time, we're friends. And I said, I got to put you on the spot. He said, okay, what is it? I said, there's a piece in there. I think when Felicia is running with the bag, the blue bag. And I said, there's a, there's a beat where she turns a corner and there's so many quick cuts from the, 
from the guards, the principal to gun to her. And I said, but there's a beat where she doesn't have the bag. And he started laughing. He said, yeah, you're right. He said, I had this shot and I needed to cut away from gun and the principal. And I, and I, I didn't have another shot of Felicia uh, uh, running with the bag. So I inserted, he said, it's about a second and a half long. And he said, it almost no one is no one. I, I only caught it because I've seen the film 30 times. He said, no one ever catches that, that, that moment. And I just think it's a wonderful, that's filmmaking. That's filmmaking. Go, oh man, I had the shot, but I'm going to be out of it in about a second. Maybe I won't get caught. I don't suggest you do that, but that's what all filmmakers have little cheats. Uh, sorry, I'm rambling. We have another question. It's kind of funny, I think. Oh, yeah, here we go. So how did he, did Bruce decide to make his film a short and not a feature just because of money? Um, do you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the reason he decided to make his short, this uh, film uh, was his advanced uh, film at NYU, his senior year. Uh, it's, it's like his thesis film. It's like, you know, and those films, you have a very um, small budget to work with. Which goes back to why it's not why it's cards and not heroin, joke, um, and um, and and the films cannot be any longer than twenty minutes. So the rules of the first run film festival contest for thesis films at NYU is films are not allowed to be longer than twenty minutes. Um, so he had to adhere to those rules because this is his thesis film. That's why it's, that's why it's a short. I've seen people. It's rare, but I've seen people make um, um, really, excuse me, really good shorts and studios look at them and this is rare, but studios look at them and go, there's a feature in here. There's a feature film and let's buy it. Let's make the feature. So, but um, Bruce might have been able to do that with this. It's so good. I hope you guys liked it. Uh, so it? here we go. Here's a question. So this this is sort of a two part question because I've been seeing people He's ask. A very cool looking guy. I, where did he get those glasses? <laughs> I'll ask. I'll find out for you. Okay. Send you yeah. the link. So is it imperative for a short to have a three act structure? Uh, and then yeah. also sort of flowing into that, what were the act breaks for caught? Wow. Yeah. Damn. Okay. Uh -huh. So it's not. What you want to do, you want to work with three act structure. Um, for a number of reasons, it gives your, it gives, it gives your, the story focus. It gives it a spine. You'll hear me keep talking about a spine, but it gives a direction. Um, you want to do that. You want to work with three act structure. It's not always possible in a short I've seen, you know, but the good ones, the good ones typically have th three act structure. Um, in this, in this film, uh, the, the, the structure is, is pretty clear. The first act's a little long, but when he sees Felicity and they have that flashback and there's that moment where he lost the card, her, uh, Wiley, what's it? Wiggly flop. Um, in, in terms of <laughs> oh God, Wiggly, what, what? Wiggly tough. <laughs> Wiggly flop. Tough, tough, yeah. tough, tough, tough. Tough, shit, <laughs> let me write this down. Uh, um, I yeah, it's you know, it's like it's Friday afternoon. Um, what was I saying? So at that moment, he says, "I've got to get that card." That's the end of the first act. The end of the first act is he identifies his objective. I must get that card. He's the second act runs all the way up till um, he's on the roof and he has to choose whether to take the card or to forsake it all and throw the bag, throw the cards away. Um, that's the third act. Third act is literally in this film and, and it happens frequently in um, shorts, is a page long, if that. So it, the, the third act is when he gets to the roof and the principal says, here it is. And he says, nope, I'm not gonna let you, I'm not gonna turn it all over for you. So that's the structure. It's a long second act, it's good. That is 17 minutes is a long, is a long short film. Okay, let's see. Um, here's
here's an interesting question. So in caught the script in the script the agents have names i noticed that too but i don't really ever remember them being named in the film is there a general rule about the necessity between script of names between script and yeah film? yeah okay so in the script you you any of the principal characters with speaking parts name them because uh that keeps the reader aware of who who they're watching um you don't want to just keep saying, you don't want to, I mean, you could keep saying the principal, the principal, the principal, the principal, but to give him a name uh, and, and all the major role, uh, roles, names in the script, then in the, um, uh, in the film, you don't necessarily have to use the name unless it, unless it's in keeping with the dialogue. Uh, what's the principal's name? I forget his name. Do I know? I don't, I mean, in the script, they're all vice principals, something or other. I don't remember. Yeah. Anyway, they do mm -hmm. refer to, I think at one point, Gunn refers to the principal by name. Um, but uh, just to be clear, you want to identify um, in your script the, ma the main characters by name so that it's easier for the reader to follow. Um, the reader is your first audience. Uh, you want to make it as easy as possible for them to follow the characters and follow the storyline. The first time, by the way, the first time that you introduce a character in your script, you capitalize the character's name. Then afterwards, so if it's, if I, I don't know if Gunn has a first name, but anyway, let's say it's Jeff Gunn. Then you would, the first time that he's mentioned in the script, Jeff Gunn would be in caps. Then from there on, it would not be in caps. All right. Can the protagonist, basically, can the protagonist be their own antagonist? Can something uh, like a fear or phobia yeah. be an antagonist? Yeah, it's, it's a really difficult thing to do. Um, it's a, it's a, yes, it can happen. I don't recommend it um, necessarily for, you know, for, for, young screenwriters because it's such a tricky thing to do. I think I think I mentioned this last week, so forgive me if I'm being redundant, but it's the most obvious or one of the most obvious choices. Uh, in the movie Flight, Denzel Washington um, uh, plays a pilot who's got a drinking and a cocaine problem and he lands his plane safely and avoids killing a lot of people and all that. Um, he he is his own antagonist. He stands between um, between himself. What he wants is freedom. His objective is freedom to not be not go to jail, and he's the he's the thing that keeps getting in his own way. Um, yes, it can be done, uh, but with all of these rules that I and and elements of story that I talk about, you're gonna there are filmmakers that break them but you really have to know what you're doing uh, you know Terrence Malick Kubrick more re more recently uh, Alexander Payne you know these are these are great uh, Paul Thomas Anderson these are great filmmakers who have mastered the craft and then after they've mastered the craft they start playing with 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 the elements of stories and, and the rules but it can be done. Here's a question for you. Uh -huh. um, if you have an idea for a story, how do you know if it's better suited to be a short, a feature, or a series? Wow. Tough one. Tough one. So, um, well, let me, let me narrow it down a little bit. Um, if, if you have an idea for a film, The difference between a, a, a feature and a short is, is, is about 100 pages. And the bulk of those pages, I'm sorry to be so practical, so pragmatic about this, but the bulk of those pages is in the second act. So what you need to do is, um, if it's going to be a feature, there have to be so many obstacles 
in the second act that you can build 70 pages of story, um, 70 pages of second act story. Um, that's, the, that's the difference between, I mean, in very simple terms as, for instance, let, well, let me, I'll just play with it, see if I can make sense of this. In Caught, if you build this out, first of all, you would expand it to more days. This happens in one day. So you might have it take place over the course of a week. You would, you would meet Gunn at his home. You would have Gunn making phone calls to people to try to get the Wiggly Tough card. You would find out more about his relationship with Felicia. He would have a mentor who he could talk to and says, you know, I'm going to do this. I know it's risky. So you would build that story out and, and take it to different locations, to the deli where they hang out, to their homes, to the bedroom, um, to the park where they hang out, to the school. And you could build a whole second act. You could build this, you could build caught to a, to a feature film, but it's really, it's second act is where, where the guts of the movie is for a, for a, for a feature. So this is sort of related to that, which is how do you maintain a well-flowing short film without things getting crowded? So I, maybe I'm interpreting that wrong, but to me, that question is sort of like, how do you make sure you're not trying to jam too much? into a short? How do you make sure you're not trying to accomplish too much in a short where it gets just overwhelming for the, uh, yeah, for the audience? I mean, I'm, I'm seeing, I've read a lot of shorts, seen a lot of short movies and that is rare. It is very rare that you have too much story jammed in. Um, the, probably the test is, um, well, one of the things you can do, and I recommend all of you do this, if, if once you've got a draft, then get some friends together and read it. Read it out loud. Do, do a table read. It sits around and reads it. And then you'll hear it. And man, that is, that's eye-opening. Because table reads can be, um, they can be a bit of a shock. You know, it's not cooking the way you thought it was. They can also be wonderfully rewarding. Uh, when you go, oh my God, this was better than I thought it was. Um, and in that, you'll find the rhythm. When you hear it, you'll hear if it's got rhythm. You'll also hear scenes that are not, that are flat and either need to be rewritten or cut. Um, but, but again, typically this, this film, for instance, caught is jam packed, jam packed. And it serves the pace of the movie and the, and the, and the kind of the genre that he's, that he's working with. Um, so there, there are all those cuts, all those fast scenes. Uh, but I really, I recommend, you know, once you get a draft down, do a table read or two or three. And it, and a lot of times your ear will tell you, Oh, that scene's not working. It's too, it's too long. Nothing's happening. There's no drama or, it's just running together too much. I'm, yeah. So, yeah, I think that that was one of the best parts of your the screenwriting class I took with you, John. The advanced one was that we all every single time we went in, we just read someone's script mm -hmm. and the next thirty pages, and then we talked about it. And that was that was great. And you can also people can do that online too. Like you can set up with like a bunch of people on Zoom and go through their script online. Maybe we could help facilitate that for people who that would be great i mean that's a great idea um um yeah my advanced screenwriting class lexi yeah that 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 class is so much fun because every week we hear sections from three different scripts that are being written um about 30 pages each and we analyze them debate them talk about them after they've been read and acted out in class and um workshopping is a and you can find friends to workshop with. I have one, one caveat to that, which is um, be careful about notes. I said this last week and I'll say it again and again and again. Um, just be careful about whose notes you're, ta you're taking. Make sure that the person you're getting, you know, if you're, if you're gonna do a rewrite, make sure it's based on somebody who really knows story. And, and also your, your own instinct, you know, it's your baby, it's your script. Uh, one second, let's see. Okay, so this is tying back to a question that you answered. 
Yeah. yeah. So in last week was your last week, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. In last week's short, there were no names in the script. Is that a mistake? Would the lack of names make the script less appealing? So yes. that was then based on a true story. Was it a mistake to not give the little girl a name or the wizard? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was. Uh, Jacob. God, I love that film. But, um, and that film is about seven minutes. I mean, that's moving. But the, it, as I said a moment ago, I mean, it's, it, the, the, the real thing is for the uh, reader when it's still in script form. Um, she calls him the wizard and she calls Bodie Bodie. Now, I don't think I've read Jacob's script. I, I don't think I've read it. If I, it was a long time ago. But he should have identified Bodie and um, and the wizard uh, by name in the script. And it just makes it more reader more reader friendly. I think I think they were just called like wizard and Bodie in the yeah. So they were they were named. It wasn't like person two, but they just weren't given like Oh, they weren't John given the wizard. Names like, like John, Bob, yeah. The, Bob Bodie. Yeah. I mean, if you call him Bodie, then we, we know who we're following. That's probably okay. That's probably fine. Cool. Let's see. Um, here's a cool question. Any advice on writing action on a screenplay? How do you know when you're getting too descriptive? Oh, man. This is a great question. Uh, the other day I taught this class, and I had a guest come in. Um, should I name the name? Yeah, it's fine. I had Nick Nick Hughes come in, and Nick uh, just co-wrote um, The Hunt uh, with uh, Damon Lindenoff. And uh, Nick's written, written a bunch of uh, Leftovers and uh, Maniac and uh, Watchmen. He's a hot writer. He's a great guy. Anyway, he came to my class to talk about it, and he talked about this. So action in a screenplay. There's only, only so many times you can say, and then he hit the guy really hard and they flipped over the counter. You want to keep it pretty minimal because the director's going to come in with a fight coordinator. Okay. He's going to come in with a fight coordinator and he's going to, they're going to design the action. So rather than go on and you really don't want to do large blocks of action. If it's inherent to the story, if the if 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 the fight takes place as it does in uh, the hunt, if it if it takes place in the kitchen, then it takes place in the kitchen, interior kitchen. Character: the two women square off. One's got a frying pan in her hand, and they go at it. I think Nick said that they. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but I think Nick said that they wrote. Um, and it's just a kick-ass action scene. The end. I wouldn't suggest being quite that minimal about it, but um, if it's if it's intrinsic or inherent to the story, in fact, like if if the if the antagonist and protagonist are fighting, and then the antagonist pulls a knife out of her boot. Well, that's a big story point. So you should pull the knife out of, her, out of her boot and then they fight over the knife. But you don't want to, every punch, every kick, every, you don't want to do that because it's just boring to, it's, it's boring to read. And it won't, again, the, the stunt coordinator, the, uh, the, um, and the director will, will design, design it. So any tips for super short shorts? Wow. Uh, one to two minutes shorts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, give me a protagonist and an objective. There you go. And that because that's that's intrinsic to every story you're going to tell. Um, you, you we have to be following somebody and they have to want something. Otherwise, they're inactive. So those two. I would, I would say, give me a protagonist with an objective and either she gets it, gets the objective or she doesn't and you're out. But that's, that's, by the way, if you can do a really great 
two page short. That's impressive. Let's see. That question's related to a couple other questions that I'm seeing. So, um, one second. Sorry. It's okay. Here is a, another question. All right. So, this is do descriptions of feelings, emotions, and subtleties of mood hurt or help a screenplay? So, sort of like when you're directing the actor as a writer, does that help or hurt? Yeah. Do descriptions, feelings, emotions, sub subtleties of mood? Okay. So, that's a good question. So, the, here's the trick. A lot of times, um, if I understand the question correctly, correctly, a lot of times the 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 script will say, you know, we're tight, we're tight on the protagonist, and she's th he's thinking revenge. I'm gonna kill the guy who took my wallet. I don't know, right? Now that's internal. So. So the feeling, emotion, and subtleties of the mood are internal. And it's really, really difficult because how do we, the actor has to be a great actor to communicate what he or she is feeling. Um, so you, you want to be very cautious about doing this too often. Um, I've, I've seen it. I've seen it in scripts with a lot of this in it. And, and so the director reading this is going, Oh, wow, I'm going to be in a one shot. And the audience is going to go, what in the hell is she thinking? What the hell is she feeling? I don't know. Um, the best way around that is, is, um, whatever he, whatever he or she is feeling, whatever emotion is going on. If you give them a, a mentor, or a best friend to talk to, then we can hear what they're thinking. So if, if I'm here, I'm in a one. Okay, I was thinking I want revenge on that guy that stole my wallet. Here I am in a one. I turn to my friend and I says, "That bastard stole my wallet, and I'm going to kill him." Now we know what I was feeling. Okay. So here we go. Can an antagonist be a false antagonist? Sort of like Snape. Yeah. And Harry sort Potter. Like what? Snape and Harry Potter. He was just a jerk the whole time, but yeah. he wasn't the antagonist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it tends to be a false. It typically, yeah, you could pull it off. Generally, I think what you're talking about, and I think in Harry Potter, uh, it's it's a it's it's a, a false mentor. Uh, um, he could appear, he or she could appear to be a false mentor, and then actually turns out that they had the, the protagonist best intentions at heart. Uh, yes, you can. And it's a, it's a really good question. Um, you, you, these, all these questions are really good. There's some tricky stuff, you know, with, when, when you start to break these rules, I had a young man in class, how are we doing time one? Oh, uh, yeah, well, oh no, we're, we're good on time. I think we got started a little bit late, so we can okay. keep. I had this young man going. who wrote a fantastic script in class last week, and we just finished it up. And on page, about page 85, 90, he kills the protagonist. And I mean, the script is fantastic. And he kills the protagonist. And I'm like, what did you just do? And then what he does is he makes the protagonist love interest throughout the rest of the film through the last 25, 30 pages, maybe the third act. He makes her somebody we really care about. So I said to him after we're done, what you did, you can't do. I mean, because you broke a rule, you can't kill your protagonist before the movie is over. Because we've been following him or her all the way. I mean, you can't. It's sometimes that. Anyway, but I said, but the, but if you break that rule, and you know that what was the character's name? Nina, I think. Nina's the the, the girlfriend throughout. If we really care about her and we're so invested with her, then then maybe 
you can break the rule, kill the protagonist, and we will follow Nina the rest of the way because we care about her. But you have to make sure, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to make sure in the second act that we're emotionally invested in her if you're going to break that kind of rule. That's kind of a long way of saying if you break a rule, you have to know why you're breaking it and you generally have to, you always have to figure out how to amend it. <clears throat> I think sort of something that came that I was thinking of when you were talking about that too is that I mean that the antagonist doesn't have to actually be bad and that they can come around in the end like in all those Disney movies right they're like they're like the dad's like you can't be a singer you are a baseball player and then in the end he's like I see why you love this son and so he wasn't really like a bad antagonist and he comes around so right. you know but he did but he did <laughs> yeah no you're right and, and he did, but he did serve his purpose. He created conflict in act two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, let's see, let's try this one. So is it better? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, let's do this and then I, I yeah. So should a director write their own, like should you write and direct, kind of? Yeah, should you write and direct, right. Okay, so. Um, I mean, everybody, uh, a lot of people want to do that. I mean, everybody wants to direct their own material. The, there are two lines of thought, and I think both of them have, have weight. One is you've written the material, so you know it better than anybody. That would suggest that, that yes, you are the person who should be directing it. The flip of that, which is also really important, is that you've written the material, you've written the script, and you're so close to it that you can't see what's wrong with it. You lack objectivity. And um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something that's sacrilege right now. Martin Scorsese and Martin Scorsese actually produced my first, the first film that I had that got made. Um, Martin Scorsese is unquestionably a great, great, great director. Nobody says no to Martin Scorsese. Should I be saying this on tape? Well, too late now. Anyway, oh, so if you look at Wall, Wolf of Wall Street, <laughs> if you look at Wall, Wolf of Wall Street, in my opinion, it's too long. Scorsese you might argue was too close to the material. So if you're gonna, that's a long one, if you're gonna direct your own material, have somebody around who will tell you what's wrong with it. Because if you get that close, you've written it, if you're that close to it, you probably won't be objective enough to know what needs to be fixed. And if you have somebody whose gut has, has enough guts to say to you, you know, by the way, the second act is not right yet, you shouldn't start shooting yet. Um, that's probably somebody you should pay attention to. So if it goes both ways, you know the material the best, the better than anyone else, and yet you probably lack objectivity. Cool, so let's, we're starting to get towards the end. So I'm being asked to remind everybody that you can buy John a coffee in the link if you would like to send John a coffee, coffee for his, uh, do you have your coffee mug? Oh, there we go, see? He's drinking the drinking the coffee. I'm drinking the coffee. <laughs> drinking the grind. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see. Now we can sort of take up a couple random questions. Uh -huh. um, let's see. Let's do this. I think Valentina's back. She's back. Uh, what are big deal breakers to agents? I think I think she meant when except like when reading a script. What are the big deal breakers if an agent's reading your script or a producer's reading your script? Uh, good question. Okay, the big deal breakers: you don't know story, you don't know structure. So, the agent, you know, and I'll, I'll talk at some point about you know the business, how the business works, but the agent is really just the conduit between you and the studio or the network. 
So the agent's only as good as the material material you give the agent. Uh, and if an agent reads your script and you don't know story, you don't know structure, you don't introduce a protagonist and an objective, you've got a, a first act that, that is 50 pages long, you've done, then the agent, that's a deal breaker. Because what, what the agent wants to do is they want to be able to call the, the, the studio executive or a director or a network executive and say, I got a script that's going to blow you away. I got a script. You better drop everything and read this script. Now, that's their credibility. The agent manager's credibility is based on knowing material, knowing good material, and handing it over to the studio or network. Um, so their credibility is on the line. So if you write uh, a, a, a script that's not sound, a script that's, um, that doesn't adhere to the elements of story, they can't make that phone call because if, if, here's the antithetical one. So they make the call and they say, you got to read the script. You got to read the script. It's fantastic. And then the studio executive says, you know, you told me I should read a script. So I went home last night. I canceled dinner plans. I read the script overnight and it's crap. Why did you waste my time? You knew it was no good. Why did you waste my time? So then three days later, when agent calls and says, I got another script. This one's fantastic. The studio executive goes, no, no, no. We've been down this road. You don't know what a good script is. I'll read it when I get around to it. So the deal breaker is, 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 is it on the page? It, it can, it, the deal breaker is if you can't put it, if you don't put a structurally sound story on the page, that's a deal breaker. They can't go forward. They can't try to sell that script. And I remember that something just like very, very specific and tangible that we, you and I talked about with our head of feedback, Adam, was that, you know, if you open a screenplay with like 10 lines of scene description, if you're just looking at a wall of scene description, then that's a, often enough to get someone to put it down. Yeah, that would that would suggest the writer doesn't know what he or she's doing. Yeah. If, if there are long blocks of description. Is, now, by the way, I want to be clear. Um, Nick Hughes was talking about, uh, I think, Michael Clayton, about the script for Michael Clayton. Michael Clayton is a great, great movie. It's a great movie written by Tony Gilroy, directed by Tony Gilroy. And there's apparently a long block uh, when Gilroy, I mean, when uh, George Clooney goes up and looks at those three horses on the hill there, there's a lot long block of dialogue uh, about what, uh, what, what Clooney's thinking, what Michael Clayton, the character is thinking and feeling. Now, so that runs directly against what I just told you. Tony Gilroy is Tony Gilroy. He can get away with it. But you, as a, any of you, I'm not, Valentina, I'm not picking on you, I'm talking about all of you, as young writers, new writers trying to get an agent, you can't, you can't, you can't get away with that because you're trying to get their attention. Um, and, and those big blocks of descriptive passage are a no no. Uh, is everybody there? Here we go. SR, do you have any advice on using narration? Like, I guess that, that, that might also include like voiceover, stuff like that. If, if that's, if you're referring to voiceover, this is a funny one. I've never quite understood this, but I know this to be true. Voiceover is considered, if that's what you're referring to with narration, voiceover, the voiceover is considered a cheat. It's, con it's considered um in hollywood and in, in the movie business you know, it's considered a cheat and what they say is if you don't know how to tell the story you narrate uh, or you do use voiceover and voiceover t tends to be exposition uh exposition is i can't quite figure out how to tell you this in a story 
So I'm just going to come in tight on a one on the, on the protagonist and his voiceover will tell you where we are, what's going on and why. Well, you should be able to tell that with story as opposed to with voiceover. So that's, um, it's, it's a voiceover is kind of taboo. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, Although, done, it's done sometimes. Yeah. Like my favorite, one of my favorite films, Juno started, um, it started with the chair. Yeah. Uh, it, there are, by the way, all these rules that I keep talking about, there, there are, um, there are exceptions. There are exceptions. So this is sort of, it ties into a question you answered before, but it's a little more specific. Um, some say you sh don't write internal dialogue or feelings. Leave that for the director. Is that what you'd recommend? Um, should you only write what appears on the screen and nothing else? That's what I would recommend. That's what I would recommend. Uh, if you're telling the story, if you're telling the story well enough, and it comes to, I don't know why it comes to mind. And again, forgive me, I think I mentioned it last week, but it's such, it's such a profound moment in a film that was made years ago in the 80s, I guess. Sophie's Choice, made, made adapted from the great novel by William Styron, uh, Meryl Streep and Kevin Klein. And what is Sophie's Choice? Sophie's Choice, is, I, told, I think I said this last week, but it's just, it resonates. Uh, she has two children, she's on the train tra track, she has two daughters, and the, and, the, and, the, and the Nazis say, you can keep one. The other we're taking to the concentration camp. <laughs> Tight one on screen. You don't have to tell us what she's thinking or what she's feeling. She's about to give away one of her children. <laughs> Can you imagine like some really bad writer goes, she feels pretty sad. <laughs> I'm kidding. She's sad. This went from morose to bizarre, didn't I? Okay, well. <laughs> um, okay, here, here's a cool question because I remember we ran into this a lot in class. What about establishing tone? Can you add relevant jokes in the description that push a comedy or a certain description that would set the scene? Um, but can you, if like your film's funny, can you be funny in the scene description? Oh, it, oh, oh, this is, oh, oh, I didn't understand it quite. Yeah, okay, yeah, um, yes. Um, this is, when it's done well, man, it's, <clears throat> this is killer. This goes back to deal breakers. The other end of deal breaker is deal maker and deal maker is, de <coughs> excuse me. If you write, um, if you write a script and, um, let's say it's a dark comedy and your prose, your descriptive passages, which are minimal, have that same tone to them then you're taking the reader on a ride. If you're, if you're writing a comedy and um, your descriptive passages are funny, then it's enjoyable to the reader. And also <clears throat> you're not only establishing tone with the story you're telling, you're establishing tone, <coughs> excuse me, um, with the way with your writing. And that's, it's, it's, I gotta tell you, it's, it's rarely is it done. And when it's done, when it's done well, you know, then, then you got an agent or a manager or a producer just turning pages, just flipping through it, going, oh my God, I can't get enough, can't get enough, can't get enough. That's your job. Your job when you write a screenplay is to get somebody to sit down with it and read it all the way through in one sitting. That's what you're trying to do. Don't let them go away, don't let them put the script down. So looks like we're about to have to wrap up. We can probably do one more, one more question. And uh, before we go though, I just wanted to let everybody know that we go through all these questions and we write them down and John and I record a question of the day to post on YouTube. And we pull a lot of those, a lot of those from here. So um, 
just keep an eye out for that. There's one question of the day every day. And then a few people were asking about some upcoming, like what we have upcoming. Yeah. Um, we are, John, can we say that we're working on? Yeah. I, well, I, okay. Admittedly, I already messaged them in the group and said we were working on it. So we're working on the writing the indie feature. And um, hopefully we'll have that for you at some point soonish. We're trying our best. It's hard with, you know, everyone being stuck in their own homes. Um, and yeah. And then also, we're, what ahead. is it? So go ahead. Oh, are we going to talk about what we're going to uh, screen for next week? Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you have one in mind? Yeah, God of Love. Okay. So the next, so next week's coffee class is going to be God of Love. I think I won one an Oscar, didn't it? It was a good one. Won an Oscar. Luke, Luke Matheny uh, wrote and directed God of Love. Oh, it's a little bit hard to find, though. It's on Amazon is where I found it. And then oh, we is could, it? Yeah. It, so it costs money, but I think that we can, do we have, John, you and I will talk. And if anyone's on the email list, then hopefully we'll be able to email it to you. Email it to you okay. soon. Okay. Um, yeah. It's a great film and, and uh, it's a short and it's uh, won an Oscar. And yeah. And we'll, um, we'll send out an email soon, but probably we're, yeah. Next coffee class will be same time, same place. I'll send out links and everything. Um, later on, we're going to ask everybody what session, what session times work best, but can't yet. Um, let's see. Let's see. One last question for the road. For the road. Um, for the road. Um, man, oh man. Everybody's saying thank you, John. You're welcome. Thank you. Th by the way, thanks for coming in. And, you know, this is only our second week. Uh, Alexi and I were, you know, trying this out to see if it would fly. Uh, we've had, you know, we need you, you know. Uh, so having you participate is really it's fantastic. A lot of fun for me and, and Alexi. And uh, thanks for, for showing up. So and let's, all your good questions. Yeah, they're great questions. Let's, let's pull up this one. It's a throwback to our last class, which yeah. is in a previous session, you mentioned that Russell is the antagonist in Up and not Carl Muntz. No. Um, I agree that Russell throws obstacles in Carl's path, but don't intentions matter? Don't intentions matter? As in, like, since Russell is not malicious, can ah. he still be an antagonist? Yeah. Since, wait, say that again. Since, since Russell, he's not, like, Russell isn't, like, evil. He's just this. He's not little, evil, no. No, he's little just like this little boy. So how can he be the antagonist if he's not malicious? Ah, uh, okay, great. Okay, I got it, I got it, I got it. Okay, That's cool. a really good question. It's it's not, it's, it's, it's not the first time I've heard this question uh, with up. And it's, it's, it's really, again, really good because um, it seems tricky. Yes, he's not evil. He's not, you know, um, he, yeah, he's not malicious, uh, uh, Russell. He's a little round boy. So, <laughs> but you want the antagonist to be in the second act to be creating conflict in the second act. Um, um, in, in caught, the principle is prevalent throughout the second act. He's always there. Uh, when he's not there, he's manipulating the security guards. Um, he's, he's, he's active in the second act. Now months, and it's, a, it's, it's understandable, a lot of people have, have asked this. Months doesn't show up until the very end of Act Two. So he hasn't created any obstacles in Act Two. He hasn't been there. He was in the first frame of the film when they do the newsreel and they talk about months and da da da. He's a great explorer, adventures out there, and da da da. Get to gonna find the big bird and all that stuff. So, but we don't meet him again until they get, till the dogs take him to the cave. Um, that's the end of Act Two. He has not been actively creating obstacles 
for Carl in Act Two. But it's it's understandable that that I mean I I get the question. It it makes perfect sense. Um, but it, but you want the antagonist to be active in creating obstacles throughout um, throughout the second act. And Muntz is really Muntz just he he's great. And he's the monster that we must slay. Um, but he doesn't appear until the third act. All right, I lied. This is the last question. This is the last one. This one. Theme. Dorothy. Can you talk about theme? Wow. <laughs> Dorothy. For the last question, the big one. <laughs> okay, this this is gonna take about two hours to, to <laughs> so so buckle your seatbelt. No. Um shit. Theme is yeah. Um I know, I threw what you. is your story about? What is your story about? And I will say with almost without exception. Young man asked this very early on. That, you know, I've got a couple stories I'm playing with. How do I know which one to pursue? They almost pick you. They almost, they almost pick you. There's a story you just can't hear. I gotta, I gotta write this movie. I gotta write this script. And you write the script, and then some, for I can't, for reasons I can't explain, you step back from it, and you go, Oh God, now I know why I had to write it, because now I understand the theme. And that's good that it happens late, because otherwise you're preaching. Otherwise you're saying to the to the audience, I want you to know this, I want you to believe this. But if you if you tell a story and you <clears throat> tell it well, you'll find the theme you'll find the theme. And the theme is is what you want to say. So, for instance, in Casablanca, at the end of the film, the third act, he says to Ilsa, you must go away. He says to Ilsa, because the problems of three little people don't amount to a hill of beans. And I'm returning to the fight. I'm returning to the fight to, 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 to kill off the Nazis, to get rid of the Nazis, to save the Jews. I'm returning to that fight. So what? The, it's about a man... Thematically, it's about a man refining, embracing his humanity, his soul. Um, you could almost argue, don't take me to battle with this one, but this is a bit of a street. Nah, maybe not. You could almost argue in, in if something is action, adventure, and funny, cartoonish, uh, as Indiana Jones, um, that love conquers all. The theme is love conquers all. He didn't get his objective. He didn't get what he wanted. He didn't get the thing he's been chasing. But he found the love of his life, which he had lost. Um, in Up, thematically, what we're saying is we, have, we need each other. We need human connection. This little boy who I despised and couldn't get off my porch, now I have life because I have a human connection. Thematically, that resonates. Um, you don't want to hit the audience over the head with the theme. If you tell the story well enough, they should walk out of the theater going, feeling something. And, and whatever they're feeling, that's the theme. I hope that makes sense. So I think it's often tied to inner need a lot. A lot of times, it, 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 almost always, thank you, Alexi, absolutely. It's, it's tied to what was your inner need? And your inner need was your humanity. Was your inner need was the need for a human connection, relationship, and intimacy. And yeah. Cool. So I think that that does it for this coffee class. Wow. Yeah. But um, but we'll be back next week with God. Thank of you all. Thank you, everybody. Alexi, thank you for for everything. And, yeah. Uh, Just doing my best. <laughs> You're doing a great job. I look forward to seeing everybody next week. Okay. Take care. Be safe. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.